ATP production. ATP inhibits isocitrate dehydrogenase, and this reverses back to lead to a buildup of citrate. Citrate moves out of the mitochondria, gets into the cytosol, and in the cytosol, this citrate can be broken down and can be converted into acetyl-CoA and phosphoenol pyruvate. Ultimately, you have cytosolic acetyl-CoA. And this cytosolic acetyl-CoA is the same one that is going to undergo fatty acid synthesis, the process that we well explained previously, and it is also the same one that is going to undergo cholesterol synthesis. So, reactions of cholesterol synthesis. The reactions of cholesterol synthesis, the first few reactions in cholesterol synthesis would actually look about the same as the reactions that you're going to see in ketone body production. However, you and I know that the primary difference is that ketone body synthesis is occurring in the mitochondria. Also, ketone body synthesis is occurring in a circumstance where you are starved. Remember? You would be starved, then increased breakdown of fatty acids produces a lot of acetyl-CoA in the mitochondria, then to free the CoA, ketone bodies are going to be synthesized, right? However, cholesterol synthesis is occurring when you have consumed a lot of carbohydrate. And this is now happening in the cytosol, while um, the synthesis of ketone bodies is in the mitochondria. So cholesterol synthesis, much as it occurs mainly in the cytosol, it does have an interface where it also gets to be produced partly in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And it may use some of the enzymes in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which would exist in some cases as transmembrane proteins. So, cholesterol synthesis, how does it start? Again, it starts from acetyl-CoA. So you would have acetyl-CoA, which came from the citrate, and two molecules of calcium acetyl-CoA are actually going to combine with each other in the cytosol. Once these two acetyl-CoAs combine, similar to the initial reaction that we talked about in ketone body synthesis, you would notice that there would be a CoA going out, and ultimately there would be production of acetyl acetyl -CoA. This is catalyzed by the enzyme theonates. This enzyme catalyzes the first reaction of cholesterol synthesis as well as the first reaction of ketone body synthesis. Guys, you might be asked a question to say which enzymes are you going to see both in cholesterol synthesis and ketone body synthesis? One of them is theonates. In your MCQs. Further, you would notice that the next reaction would also be the same. It would be another acetyl CoA coming in. That acetyl CoA comes in. CoA goes out and your end product is going to be a hydroxy methyl glutary glutary CoA There we go. Nope. Not two. One. It's correct. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Correct. So this, guys, is hydroxymethylglutarate for A, and it is also referred to as 3 hydroxy 3 methyl glutarate CoA because it has a hydroxyl group at carbon number 3 and a methyl group at carbon number 3. We saw this one, didn't we? 
in, in ketone body synthesis. This is one of the products, 3-hydroxy-3-methylglutarium-CoA or beta-hydroxy-beta-methylglutarium-CoA. So, in short, HMG-CoA is the product. Enzyme HMG-CoA synthesis and as this reaction is occurring, there is also water that is going to come in. It will allow the condensation of acetoacetal CoA, which is here, acetal CoA, and an acetal CoA. This, friends, marks the point at which the similarity between cholesterol synthesis and ketone body synthesis seems to end. In ketone body synthesis, you discover that there is going to be a layer that will come in, removing an acetal CoA, producing um, an end product, acetoacetate goes down in ketone body synthesis. However, in cholesterol synthesis, this hydroxymethylglutarin CoA, which is produced, is actually going to be reduced. Again, we emphasize that synthesis or biosynthesis of these molecules would require the, pre the presence of a common reducing equivalent, which is NADH plus H plus. NADPH plus H plus is actually the reducing equivalent which is necessary in reductive biosynthesis. Alright? Plus H plus. This is necessary in reductive biosynthesis. Formation of lipids requires NADPH plus H plus. Formation of cholesterol also requires the presence of NADPH plus H plus. Is that clear? Is this okay? So the next reaction is that this cholesterol is going to be reduced by two molecules of NADPH. Two. Make this clear. That these are actually going to reduce your hydroxymethylglutarin CoA, and they are going to produce a molecule of mevalonate. In the process, the CoA comes off, and the release of the CoA is the one that would be necessary to drive the production of mevalonate in this case. So this CoA comes off and the end product also with six carbons H2 The end product product is mevalonic. Mevalonic acid. That will be the production of mevalonate, which involves a reduction reaction. You may be aware the reduction reactions would mainly be catalyzed by enzymes which we call reductases. So the enzyme that will catalyze this is hydroxymethylglutarin CoA reductors. Guys, I'm pleased to tell you this enzyme is very necessary. It's the most important enzyme and critical enzyme in the regulation of cholesterol synthesis. Hydroxymethylglutarin CoA reductors. It's the committing reaction 
to cholesterol synthesis. It is also the enzyme which is regulated during cholesterol synthesis. Also, we should be pleased to know that it is this same enzyme that is inhibited by the group of drugs called the statins. The drugs that are given to people who actually have high cholesterol. They inhibit the enzyme hydroxymethylglutarate-4A reductors. So if you ask the question, which enzyme is inhibited during cholesterol synthesis by statins, is going to be hydroxymethylglutarate-4A reductors to prevent the production of mevalonate. All right? Yes, now that the mevalonate has been produced, I want to just go ahead and show you some of the few other important reactions that will actually occur to ultimately produce cholesterol. After all, you started with a molecule which has two carbons. You are probably wondering how then does this lead me to a molecule with about 27 carbons, right? So, so far, after these condensation reactions, you had acetoacetyl-CoA, which had four carbons. You bring in another acetyl-CoA. You have hydroxymethylglutarate-CoA, which has six carbons. So far, you know where these six carbons have come from. And at this point, this molecule also has six carbons. Right? The next series of reactions would actually lead to production of another molecule which requires the presence of two molecules of ATP. ATP, ATP, ATP. So two ATPs are actually hydrolyzed in order to drive the next reaction. And what is going to happen is that the phosphates that came from here are going to attach to mevalonates. And they will actually attach at carbon number 5. And the end product is going to be called 5 pyrophosphomevalonate. 5 pyrophosphomevalonate because there are two phosphates attached in a pyrophosphate to mevalonic acid. So the end product will have phosphates there. And here it is. Two pH two of phosphate phosphate. This friends is five pyrophosphomevalonate. Okay, I'm going to screen for this. 5 pyrophosphomevalonate. That is going to be your end product in this reaction. Uses two molecules of ATP. So a pyrophosphorylase would actually transfer these phosphates onto mevalonate to produce 5 pyrophosphomevalonate. The next reaction is going to be a decarboxylation reaction and this decarboxylation reaction also is an active reaction so it is going to remove this carbon dioxide as it occurs, and it uses ATP as well. The end product is called isopentanyl pyrophosphate. It's a decarboxylation reaction, and because the decarboxylation reaction, the number of carbons that are going to remain with here are no longer going to be six, they are going to be five. And since this reaction here, we have seen it before a number of times, Please allow me a moment. Okay, thank you.
And the prayer is that we are not wrapping these things in people's minds as well. <laughs> and imagine somebody saying, no, oh, don't worry, they are already not there. <laughs> Alright, so the next reaction is going to be a decarboxylation reaction. This carbon dioxide comes off, uses ATP, 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 plus a phosphate in order to drive this reaction. The end product of this reaction is actually not going to have this thing here and it's going to be something like that. So this, put it just down here. So this is what is going to be a result of this reaction. Let me just remove this energy reaction. So this end product here is referred to as isopentanin. Somebody told me about my good handwriting. Wow. Isopentanyl pyrophosphate. Guys, is this visible finally? Oh, thank you. Isopentanyl pyrophosphate. Sorry? It's visible, yes. It is, huh? <laughs> yeah, interesting. So, isopentanyl pyrophosphate, this is referred to as a nonlinear isoprenol. In fact, isopentanyl pyrophosphate, particularly, what this is, it's the source of most of the molecules referred to as isoprenoids. Example of isoprenoids include nonlinear isoprenoids like dolico, which is necessary uh, in the process of protein 14 and also it includes what is called ubiquinol or coenzyme Q. If you remember in the electron transport chain, we made mention that there is an intermediate of cholesterol synthesis which is necessary for production of coenzyme Q, right? Therefore, if there are problems in the production of cholesterol, such as some of these uh, autosomal uh, some of these autosomal recessive disorders that might lead to perturbations in the production of cholesterol, you will discover that some of these intermediates may not be produced and ultimately it would affect the production of coenzyme Q and energy production. An example of them is what is called, is this Smith-Lamley Ortiz syndrome? That syndrome has the ability to affect the production of cholesterol, particularly if the part where it affects the production of 70 hydrocholesterol reducts 70 hydratase. 7 reductase. That enzyme does not get produced and hence the production of cholesterol is actually affected. So there could be some reactions or some disorders that could lead to the deviations in the production of cholesterol, and as such, such isoprenoids 
cannot be produced, and when they are not produced, their end products cannot actually be produced. Donico, if not produced, protein folding could be affected. Ubiquinone, if not produced, energy production is going to be affected because coenzyme Q cannot be produced. Are we together? At this point, because of the decarboxylation reaction, you would notice that the end product that you have here is actually no longer going to have six carbons, but it will have five carbons. So isopentanyl, as the name already suggests, isopentanyl pyrophosphate has five carbons. Next reaction is isopentanyl pyrophosphate gets isomerized. Allow me to just abbreviate this as IPP 